In 2002, less than a year after the 9-11 attacks, in the summer of 2002, a guy named Mark Klein was working at AT&T in San Francisco. He'd worked for AT&T for about 20 years at that point. He'd worked in New York City and in White Plains, New York. He transferred to California. He'd worked for AT&T there in a couple of different cities. But by the summer of 2002, he was in San Francisco for AT&T. He was a lifer at AT&T. He was a trusted longtime employee. And then one day while he was at work, he got a message. In 2002, I was sitting at my workstation one day and some email came in saying that somebody from the National Security Agency, NSA, was going to come visit for some business. This NSA representative showed up at the door. I happened to be the one who opened the door. I let him in. He was doing a background check for a security clearance for one of our field engineers. He was going to be working uh, at uh, the Folsom Street office and they were building a secure facility there. And I heard from our manager, Don, that uh, he's working on some new room that's being built. So people start speculating, well, what's this new room being built? Mark Klein got suspicious when the workman constructing the room treated it as hush-hush. So how do you know that it wasn't just some kind of newfangled AT&T thing that was going beyond what had already been established for its security purposes elsewhere? They wouldn't need the NSA for that purpose. The odd thing about the whole room, of course, was that only this one guy who had clearance from the NSA could get in there. So that changes the whole context of what this is about. Okay, when that guy, Mark Klein, longtime employee of AT&T, when he got that message about this newfangled room that was being built, uh, he was working in San Francisco a few blocks away from where that mysterious new room was going to be constructed. So this is in 2002. Mark, Mark Klein did not initially work at that office. But the following year, 2003, it so happened that he actually got transferred to that office. So now, this thing that he'd been so curious about, he was now working in the same building where that secret room was in operation, secretly. The room was about 24 feet long by 48 feet wide, and it was labeled as room 641A. Mark Klein and his coworkers at that Folsom Street office, they had keys to all the rooms in that whole AT&T complex on Folsom Street, but they did not have the key to room 641A. Only one guy in the whole building, that guy who had the NSA clearance, only that one guy had a key to that room, and only he was allowed in there. Mark Klein later testified that at a certain point, the air conditioner in room 641A started dripping. It started dripping so much that water from the secret room started leaking through the floor onto some expensive company equipment that was on the next floor down. But that one guy, that one guy with the NSA clearance who was allowed to go into room 641A, he wasn't around. So there was nobody to go in and fix the problem. And so they just left the air conditioner dripping for days until that guy came back. Mark Klein worked on the internet side of AT&T, not on the phone side. He was a high-tech guy for AT&T. And it turned out that even though he was not allowed into that secret room in the building with the leaky air conditioner, right? Turns out that secret room had something to do with the kind of work that he did for AT&T. Klein's job was to maintain AT&T's internet service for several million customers. Domestic and international traffic all mixed together. We're talking about billions and billions of bits of data going across every second, right? A co-worker showed Klein how their internet room was directly connected to the secret NSA room through a special device called a splitter. So what they do with a splitter is they intercept that data stream and make copies of all the data, and those copies go down on the cable to the secret room. What this thing was is a very full-scale device to take all communication, voice and data, and send it both wherever it was supposed to go, but also shunt it off to a little listening room. So what exactly was going on in that listening room? Klein found clues at work one day. I came across these three documents, and I brought them back to my desk. And when I started looking at it, I looked at it more. And finally, I, it dawned on me sort of all at once, and I almost fell out of my chair. 
Those documents were wiring documents, wiring diagrams. Mark Klein would later tell the Washington Post, this splitter was sweeping up everything, vacuum cleaner style. NSA is getting everything. These are major pipes that carry not just AT&T's customers, but everybody's. He told the Post, that was my aha moment. They're sending the entire internet to the secret room. And Mark Klein blew the whistle when he figured out that they were sending the entire internet to the secret room. He sued, he joined a lawsuit in an effort to try to make AT&T stop what it was doing in room 641A in that office on Folsom Street. That was 2006. And meanwhile, a bunch of other stuff like this had started to be exposed. The New York Times had reported on warrantless wiretapping in late 2005. The brave Windsor, Connecticut librarians had come forward about the national security letters that they got, ordering them to hand over information about how people were using the library. USA Today published a really important piece in 2006 about widespread indiscriminate vacuuming up of mass amounts of internet communication. Piece by piece, it was all starting to come out. But people getting upset about it, piece by piece, did not make it go away. The result of people getting upset about it was that it was codified into law. So it became no longer illegal spying on people. It was, it was the exact same spying on people, but now legalized. That was the change that happened once people got upset. They kept doing it, they just made it legal. So if you care about lawlessness, some progress was made there in that the law was changed to now a law for what, allow for what was previously illegal behavior. If you only care about lawlessness, maybe that's progress. But if you cared about the substance of the law breaking, if you care about spying itself, Really, no progress was made. None of that stuff was ever dialed back after it was exposed, ever. The guy who saw them setting up the room in 2002 to secretly copy the whole internet, he's right, that's what they were doing. And nothing stopped them from doing that since, as far as we know. It seems to have been pretty plainly illegal when the government was doing that in room 641A starting a decade ago. That kind of thing got less illegal over time when Congress passed and President Bush signed legislation to bring all this stuff above board. One of the most contentious issues in that whole process was what would happen to these companies who illegally helped the government do this illegal spying. Could the companies get sued for that? Could the companies get in trouble for having done that when the government acted illegally? Well, after much lobbying from the White House, Congress voted in 2008 to retroactively grant immunity to all the telecom companies, all the internet companies, all the phone companies, all those companies who had acted illegally in helping the Bush administration do what was only now being declared a legal thing. It appears that they had done something illegal, but Congress made it so the companies couldn't be sued for it or prosecuted for it. So now here we are, 2013, with yet more details exposed about them secretly copying the whole internet every day. And this time, it's not just a secret room at AT&T on Folsom Street in San Francisco. From The Guardian on Wednesday night, it's Verizon. The Wall Street Journal today says it's also AT&T and Sprint and unnamed internet service providers and credit card companies. Then from The Guardian and The Washington Post, we get details of the PRISM program, sweeping up vast amounts of internet everything, your emails, your videos, your photos, your chats, from most of the big famous internet companies, Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, Facebook, AOL, Skype, YouTube, Apple. This is, this is the question of the day. The companies are all basically denying it. I mean, back in the day, that AT&T story, AT&T just no commented, everybody. We do not comment on matters of national security. And this week, too, when the initial leak this week was just Verizon, they started off as just no comment. But take that with a grain of salt, right? Because we also know from the leak, from the leaked court ruling about Verizon that was the source of that whole story, we know from that court ruling that Verizon is not allowed to tell anybody that they're doing this thing that the government is ordering them to do. They're sworn to secrecy. So no, Verizon isn't confirming it, but maybe they couldn't confirm it even if they wanted to. That's Verizon so far. But for the other leak, for the internet companies, this PRISM program thing, for the internet companies, it's not no comment. It's not we don't want to talk about this. It's not we can neither confirm nor deny this. For the internet companies, it is a flat out, no, we are not doing this. It's weird, right? I mean, the statements from the internet companies are weird. Guardian covered it today, following up on their own reporting. Within the tech companies and talking on and off the record, executives say they had never even heard of PRISM until contacted by The Guardian for comment on it. 
Senior officials with knowledge of the situation within the tech giants admitted to being confused by the NSA revelations and said if such data collection was taking place, it was without the company's knowledge. Yahoo says, we do not provide the government with direct access to our servers, systems, or network. Apple says, we have never heard of Prism. We do not provide any government agency with direct access to our servers. Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook put out this statement tonight. I want to respond personally to the outrageous press reports about Prism. Facebook is not and never has been part of any program to give the U.S. or any other government direct access to our servers. We have never received a blanket request or court order from any government agency asking for information or metadata in bulk, like the one Verizon reportedly received. And if we did, he says, we would fight it aggressively. We hadn't even heard of PRISM before yesterday. Microsoft is the company that is described by the NSA in these documents as having been first into this program. And the Microsoft denial is really, really specific. Maybe they thought they had to be specific on this matter since their whole ad campaign right now is all about how much they love your privacy. But, but check out, whatever they said it, check out the way and the, with the specificity with which uh, Microsoft denied it. Microsoft says, we provide customer data only when we receive a legally binding order or subpoena to do so, and never on a voluntary basis. Okay, so they're saying we only do it when we're forced to. All right, fine. But wait, there's more. They also say, quote, in addition, we only ever comply with orders for requests about specific accounts or identifiers. If the government has a broader voluntary national security program to gather customer data, we don't participate in it. We don't participate in it. We're not doing that. So the companies are responding to this leak this week by saying, not us, we're not doing it. Effectively, they're saying if it is happening, it is happening against our will. We were never given a chance to say no. We would have said no. And here is the problem with understanding how that could be so. Why is Twitter not on the list of companies? Why is Twitter not on the list of companies that the NSA says it's gotten this thing? I mean, this is the slide that leaked, right? This April 2013 slide, which shows supposedly all of the companies that the NSA says are in this program. You know, Yahoo and Google and Facebook and all the rest of them. Twitter's just as big a company as all those companies. Twitter handles just as much private information, just as much potentially identifying information, including geolocating information, as any of those companies. The NSA and the FBI want all of those other companies' data in this system, but not Twitter data? Are they not interested in Twitter data? Or did they ask Twitter for access to their users' data and Twitter said no? They would not let them have it, and so they're not on the list, but all those other companies are. Apple held on and apparently didn't get into the system until five years after Microsoft got into the system. Had Apple been resisting? Had Apple been saying no before and then they stopped saying no and they finally got brought in? Did the NSA figure out a way to go around their saying no and get their data without them? The NSA presentation reportedly bragged that Dropbox was next. Dropbox was gonna have its data in the program soon. Is that because NSA figured out how to wrangle Dropbox's data against Dropbox's will? Or is it because they convinced Dropbox to say yes? Are the companies going along with this or not? Are they legally allowed to say if they are? Are they lying? Are they immune from any legal liability for lying about it? Are they immune from legal liability in terms of how they're treated their customers, how they've behaved as a business because of that blanket immunity that Congress gave the whole industry back in 2008? You know, we know a lot more today than we did at the beginning of this week, but some of what has been told to us about this program and the businesses through which this government is getting all of our private information that we thought was private, some of this story still does not make sense, even at the most basic level. I mean, if you're, let's say you, uh, you have a, a Google account and you use Gmail, right? If you are feeling mad this week about the fact that you just found out that all of your Gmail is in a military computer somewhere, your government is holding your Gmail in a military computer somewhere. And you want to know, you're mad about that. And you want to know if Google's one of the people you should be mad at about that. I can't tell you. Kind of seems like Google must have gone along with this in order for them to get that data. But Google is saying, not it, not our fault. We never said okay to this. And objectively, I have to tell you, it is just not clear. Also not clear, or at least still contested at this point, is whether or not Congress really did sign off on all of this. Some members of Congress, since this has all come out, have been saying, ah, this is no big deal. We've known about this forever. This program's been going on for years. We all knew about it. It's totally authorized. 
Nothing to see here. The president today took that line as well. This has been authorized by Congress multiple times by big bipartisan majorities. Every member of Congress knew about this, the president said today. But some of the people who supposedly knew, knew about this, who, who supposedly were briefed on it and who authorized it and all the rest, some of those people are contesting that now too.